add and the get instead of the normal array-like syntax. So, where in an array we might refer to something like this, if we had uh, an array of A, we would refer to the element in position 1 as A sub 1. If we have an array list and we wanted the element in position 1, we would say AL get 1. So in this example, A is assumed to be an array, AL is assumed to be an array list. So it's all done through the methods, and, and again, it's a, it's a more rich object-oriented implementation of, of a very similar sort of structure. Let's look at some of the other methods. Is empty. Index of will tell me where it is on the list. Like let's say, for example, maybe we're looking to see if Steve is a uh, member of this project, and if he is, then we delete him. All right. Um, remove. We can remove an object if it's there. And so on down the line. Size is a, is a, is a good one as well. And um, that's the equivalent of saying like the length of an array, all right, it, to call the size method. Trim to size would be to cut the capacity down to whatever the current size is. So let's say you got over uh, ambitious and allocated a gigantic amount of space for it when you declared it. At some point when it became clear, maybe in your program that is, that your array list wasn't going to be bigger than a certain size, you could say trim the size and you could free up some memory that way. Two array will actually return an array equivalent of the array list. So if there's something that needs an array, you can return that. So as you can see, there's, a, there's tons of, of benefits to this. There's tons of cool methods that don't exist with the array. Stuff that you'd have to write yourself if you needed to with an array. Um, that are already built into the array list. Uh, again, uh, the idea is, is that this is uh, you know, a, a new and improved array and um, it, it, it serves the role of being a component that we can plug in and we get all these features that, that are good so we don't have to write them ourselves. All right? And any time that, that you know, we want to look for stuff in the Java API that we don't have to write code ourselves that we can take advantage of. And so this would be an example for array processing. Rather than writing a bunch of functions that manipulate an array, a lot of them are already available on the array list. Now, are there any drawbacks? There's one drawback. And we're just going to file that away in our head for now. And we'll come back to it a little bit today and maybe in the future. And the drawback is, is that an array list, the members have to be object references. The, the, the members can't be primitives. Okay? That has a couple of implications. And, and we'll see one of those implications today and, and we'll talk about uh, another, another one of them later. Okay. So. We'll keep this up in case we need to refer to it. Let's look at the project class. All right. I've changed the constructor, the one argument constructor. Thanks. If you remember, the one argument constructor used to say take arg c and set it equal to c when c was declared as just a consultant. But now that c is declared as an array list, I take that consultant argument and I add it to my array list. Well, by definition, that's going to be the first element of the array list, right? Because this is code that's in the constructor, all right? And when I, one of the attributes is a new array list. So when this line is executed, I know I have never added anything to that array list yet. So by definition, this is the first element on the list. All right. I then went and added a two argument constructor because maybe one of the common things that they have, maybe 
Solo projects and two people projects are the most common. So I wrote a constructor for both scenarios. We already had the one for one consultant. And what I did is I added a second method, um, second constructor for project that accepts customer, hours, and two consultant objects. Now, we could, we could extend this indefinitely, right? We could, we could write a, th a three argument one. We could write one that accepted an array. Again, keep in mind when you're building a class like this, you want to build things that are going to help people do their common jobs. So in this case, my assumption was that projects were mostly one or two people uh, projects. So I wrote construct uh, constructors to handle those. Um, one of the things we might add is to how to add someone to the project. If, for example, there were three people on it. Or we could write a constructor that would, that would take an array of consultants. So we could do a few different things. So at any rate, now, the first consultant I enter is in, consult, uh, is in position one in that array, or position zero, rather, in that array list. The second consultant is in position one. All righty. Now, the other change I made is in this. Now to calculate the revenue, and I'm assuming in this one that if it's 100 hour projects, both consultants work 100 hours. So that's an assumption as well. In calculate revenue, it used to be I simply took the hours and multiplied it times the consultant's billing rate. Now I have to go in and loop through all of the consultants which is exactly what I'm doing here. I'm, set, I'm setting up my revenue variable, my result variable to zero. I have my loop that will initialize i at zero. It will loop through as long as i is less than the size, the size being the number of elements in that array list. And each time through, I'm incrementing by i. I have this statement that I'm not going to completely explain now. We'll just have to take on faith that it works. And, and in a minute here, we'll talk about what, I'm, what it's doing and why I need to do that. But what I'm doing is I'm grabbing the consultant off the list in position i. So the first iteration through the loop, i has a value of 0. The second iteration, i has a value of 1 in this particular case, since it's a two-person project. I'm grabbing that consultant object storing it in X. Again, remember when we do an assignment statement like that, we are storing the object reference. And then I'm going and I'm calculating and I'm adding on to that result the hours times that consultant's billing rate. So this will simply loop through and each iteration through the loop, it will grab each consultant's billing rate using that method multiply it by the hours, and add that to the running total. When I'm all done, I return the result. The expense is just about the same, except it uses a pay rate. All right. And the margin is actually identical. It takes, first calculates the revenue, then subtracts the expenses. All right. Now, let's look at my test code for this one. My test code for this one creates two consultants, Mike and Susan. And it creates a new project. And I am calling the constructor that accepts four arguments, the name of the customer, the number of hours, and the two consultants. And so that consultant that's pointed to by C gets added in position zero. This one gets added in position D. And then I am asking this project to calculate the expense. So it again will go through and loop through the expenses. It will grab the pay rate for each of the consultants and multiply that by the number of hours, which is 100. Now let's make sure this worked, right? Let, let's go and, and run this and make sure that it works. And it says the expenses are 7,000. Is that right? Well, let's take a look. What kind of consultant was Mike? Regular, right? Because I called the one argument constructor for Mike. 
And that means that I'm defaulting his type to R. Susan, on the other hand, I'm calling the two argument constructor on, which means she's set to a senior consultant. So Mike is regular, Susan is senior. Therefore, Mike's pay rate is going to be 30. Susan's pay rate is going to be 40. So Mike's contribution to the expense will be 30 times 100, which is 3,000. Susan's will be 40 times 100, which is 4,000. Add that together, 7,000. Okay. Now again, this is only set up to do two, but you can easily see how we could expand that. All right. So that works. Everything's happy. Um, now let's go back and look at the things that, that I said uh, that we weren't going to explain then, and we're going to explain them now. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do this. Notice how I have two lines that look almost like each other. I'm going to uncomment one and comment out the other. Because you might think this is a line that I need. I'm going to make x equal to the ith element of that array list. Right? So the first time through, x will have a value of element 0. The second time through, x will get the value of element 1. So that would be a very reasonable thing to say. The get method returns an element um, from the array list, as we said, like that. So it would be very reasonable to assume that that's what I would have to do. However, when I go and compile this, Boom. It blows up. And it tells me incompatible types. All right? X I've declared to be a consultant. C get I, the get I method of an array list obviously then must not return a consultant object. All right? Because if it returned a consultant object, we wouldn't have this problem. All right? Let's look at the, the documentation and see what that get method returns. And that get method returns I don't think this, this documentation is as clear as it could be. Pardon me? No, it's the argument, not the, re not the argument, but the return value I'm interested in. The return value of this is actually an object. All right? So, therefore, this statement blows up when I compile. Why? Because C dot get I could return any object, right? It could turn, return any object that I have put in that array list, all right? I can actually put any object in an array list. In fact, I can mix objects in an array list, right? I could have an array list that contains projects and consultants if that served my purposes. So therefore, if I do use the get method, it's going to return whatever object is in that position and, unless I'm careful, I have no way of knowing what that object is. So, I can't assign just any object to an object reference of type consultant. All right? That'll blow up. And as we saw, it blow, blew up at compile time. Because the compiler doesn't know, all the compiler knows is c.getI is going to return an object. And I'm trying to stuff an object in an object reference variable that can only hold a consultant object. So that's a penalty. Throws a flag, gives me a compile error. Now, we know something about this problem, right? We know that the only things we've been stuffing in that array list are consultants, right? The Java compiler doesn't know that, but we know that. Therefore, we can do what's called casting, all right? And what casting is, is you could think of it like uh, converting in a way 
probably the better way to think of it is think of it as I'm going to treat this thing like something other than it is. All right? So, the line that works then, the line that I'm going to now on comment out, says take the object that you get from this method and let's treat it as though it's a consultant object. We're going to cast it as a consultant object. Now, we've seen a similar syntax before in this class. Does anyone recall when? I'm not making this up. We did. Yeah, uh, double to an in yeah. When when we did the random number generator, um, we wanted to generate a uh, a, a subscript uh, to an array. So we did something like, and again, the the, the exact syntax is going to escape me. But we did something like int. Was it math random times six maybe? Something along those lines. And what that did is this expression actually is a double. Well, we said, okay, we know it's a double. We want to treat it like it's an integer. And the effect of treating it like an integer is it's going to get rid of the decimal places. So it will become, it's like converting it to an integer. Here we're saying a similar thing but a little bit different, we're saying, all right, I've stacked the deck. I know that there can only be consultants in here, so I feel safe to say, treat that object that I get back from the array list, treat it as though it's a consultant. All right? Question? So what do you do if you don't know? <laughs> what do you do if you don't know for sure? Well. We'll see that Java doesn't even like this. The Java compiler doesn't really even like this. What you would do is um, there, there is code that you can test to find out the type of the object it is, and then you could cast it accordingly. The other thing you could do is you could try and cast it and, and catch any exceptions that happen. So depending on the circumstances, you might do either or one of those. Here we haven't, we haven't talked about exceptions yet. Um, and uh, again, we could, I guess we could look at the type of, but it really wouldn't benefit us here. So therefore, we're just going to make sure that we, we play nice and, and only give it consultants until we get later on. So I'm going to go and compile this now with this cast statement in. And when I do that, it gives me a warning, all right? It knows I've done something dangerous, <laughs> all right? Uh, unchecked or unsafe operation. That sounds ominous. And we can, we can use this switch for details. Let's see what it says. Oh. I think that means that that's going to suppress the warning message. Maybe. I don't know. Because we compile with X, L, I, and T, unchecked. Colon unchecked. Oh, thank you. I misread that. Hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of missing. Um, what's going on here. But at any rate, the bigger issue is it knows we did something that could be bad. We've con we're assuming that this is a consultant object when this actually could return an object of any type. All right? But because we knew that we played by the book, it were okay, and and therefore it works. All right. So you just recompile and it gets rid of the... I am not sure why that warning error disappeared. Warning message disappeared. Yeah, I I, I really don't know why that warning message uh, disappeared. 
the second through. I'm not really sure what that XLINT does, I will say. I thought it was going to give me a verbose message explaining why there was a problem, but it didn't seem to. All right, so I don't know. The bigger point here is the notion of casting. And you're allowed to cast um, any object to another object, but if it doesn't fit, if it's not an object of that type, you're going to have a problem. Now when we talk about inheritance, we'll talk about two kinds of casting. Upcasting and downcasting. Upcasting is where you take a variable and treat it as one of its ancestors on the in inheritance chain. And downcasting is just the opposite. This would be an example of downcasting, where I'm taking an object which is higher on the inheritance chain and downcasting it to something lower on the inheritance chain. And I, if I'm not mistaken, inheritance is the topic next week. Let me Google this real quick. to make sure I didn't switch up and down casting. Upcasting is allowed in Java, however, downcasting gives a compile error. Yes, okay. Right, because I can't tell an object. I was trying to, I, okay. Got it. All right, so now let's go and extend this a little bit. Let's go in and where we can maybe remove Susan from the project. All right, so let's write a method on the project that says remove consultant. What do you suppose our argument will be? What type will our argument be? It won't be the name of the consultant. We'll give the consultant object. Let me back up for a second. We could give the name of the consultant and write another, write code to look through and look to see which consultant had that name and then eliminate them if we were sure that the names were unique or we could do an ID number or something like that. So let me back up. What you said wasn't wrong. That's just not what I wanted to do at this point. All right. Now, we can look at the Java documentation for the array list. And there is a remove that will remove an instance of that object from the list if it's present. So I can say then C dot remove arg. And that should do the trick. C is our array list, we call remove, and we're removing the consultant argument that we pass. Let's go and change our test case to we'll calculate how much the project will cost with Susan on the job and how much the project will cost without. So I'll create it with the two uh, consultant constructor. We'll figure out the expenses. Then I'll say p.remove, or what I, what I call that function, p 
p.remove consultant d and then let's calculate the expense after All right, so sure enough, it's 7,000 with Susan, 3,000 without, because then you're only left with Mike, who's a regular consultant. That makes um, $30 an hour, so 30 times 100 is 3,000. We could write a method to add a consultant to a job. So, go in to project and And let's add another regular consultant called Jeremy. And the expense should be 6000 because both Jeremy and Mike are regular consultants, so they should each get paid $30 an hour, so that's 3000 each or 6000 And sure enough, it goes through and does that. Um, let's see, what might be another fun thing to do? Um, let's, let's use the contain method. Let's see if someone is on the job. All right. So I'm going to go and... is on project and I can say returns return C contains argument and what that will do is that will see if that consultant is on part of the job or not all right so let's go and save this and let's go in my test and
We can ask if Susan is on the project. Mike's on the job, Susan isn't. Now, let's do this. Consultant F equals new consultant Mike. All right. Oops, I only want one of those. Will that return a true or false? I have two objects. Both were created with the same values in our constructor. So object C has a name of Mike and by default has a regular as his con consulting type. So does um, object reference F. F I created with the same constructor, set the name to the same value, and by default it's going to have the same consultant type. If I ask the question, is F, on the project is F in the array list. Will it say yes or no? Okay. All right. Pardon me? You didn't add Okay. But I added I added my up here. Keep in mind I might I might be just trying to fool you by saying that. So let's look. tells me that the other mic is not on the job. Why not? In terms of pointers, let's let's review this. Yes. Right. Because there's there's two separate objects on the heap. All right. Well let's make sure we see the code. I added Mike to the project. I never added F to the project, all right? And then I asked that. So the point is, is when you say is an object on the list, it's saying is the object pointer on the list. It has nothing to do with the individual object attributes, I guess is the point I was trying to make. So uh, another way to put that would be, you know, the first mic, which is in C, might have a pointer of 2,000. F might have a pointer of 9,000. That array list is containing a, a list of pointers. So what's on the pointer is 2,000. That's all it's going to look at when it looks and says, is that person on the list? Is it's going to look and it's going to compare the pointer and say, the object that's pointed to, or the object that's in position 2,000 on the heap, is that on the list? Yes, it is. The object that has a value uh, that, that, that put, that's in position 9,000 on the heap, is that on the list? No. So there's so nothing to do with the values of the attributes or all that. That's important to know when you're comparing objects even. If you ask the question, does this object equal that object, you're not comparing the attributes. You're comparing the pointers. And you're saying, is this an object reference pointing to the exact same object? Not does it have the same values or same instance variables. Now, if we were to do this, consultant F equals C. All right. Now what will it say when I ask, is other Mike on the job? It'll say true. Why? Because again, 
Now f also points to 2,000. So if I pass this, I pass the pointer of 2,000 and ask, is 2,000 somewhere on the list? Yes, it is. And so that will return a true. So let's verify that I am, in fact, correct. And sure enough, it tells me that the other, other mic object is, is on the project. All right. Kind of to summarize, I, I, and, and the, the, the main point of like the last few lectures were to talk about um, the way object references work and to make sure you kind of have a good grip on that. And the fact that one object can contain an object reference to another object. And um, you can actually delegate some stuff to that other object. In your example, uh, you, you know, you have a, a automobile, uh, you, you have a trip object that contains an automobile. When I ask the trip, how expensive are you, what's your expenses, it's going to get part of its answer from the automobile and part of its answer from the lodging object. All right, so that's a form of objects relating to each other called association or sometimes called delegation because the, 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 the trip delegates that calculation to the automobile and says, well, give me the automobile's uh, expense, give me the lodging's expense. I believe next week, I'll have to double check my notes, we'll start talking about inheritance, which is another way that classes can relate to each other in more of a parent-child relationship, whereas... The, the subclass is a more specialized form of the superclass. All right, um, it, it has all the qualities of the superclass, pl uh, plus it has some qualities of its own, or it might even override some of the qualities on the super. Yes? Uh, in a practical, in, in, yeah, so in a non-test environment, why would I do that? Are you splitting your processing? No, no, not, not that. Um, well, let, let, let's, let's think through. Is there a valid reason? Oh, absolutely. Is there a valid reason to know what's going on? Yeah, no, absolutely it is. Because, again, you could have, you know, you could have, Let's give uh, a for instance. I could actually have, and we'll go and write this. Let, let's go back to this. Let's go back to this example with the project. Let's see if this one works. With the project and the consultants. One of the things the project has is the project has an array list of consultants. All right. That's an object reference. All right, to that. I could have a object that says something like a staffing report object, all right, or a staffing report class. Where I'm listing all the projects that my organization's doing and, and who's working on them, all right. I could actually have a method on the project that says get consultant. And that get consultants could return that array list. Okay? So this staffing report could maybe be looping through a list of projects. Somewhere in there, it could say, it could have its own array list. Array list X, let's say. X equals whatever my project is dot 
get consultants. So there we have two, and, and then there could be code here to loop through and to print out the list of consultants that are there uh, or, or whatever. In that case, if you notice, what we do is we have two object references pointing to the same, uh, I, I'm, I'm pointing to the wrong thing, pointing to the same object in the heap. Yeah, you might not, yeah, the way I'm doing, in other words, yeah. In other words, the test code I write might be a little contrived just to illustrate that point. I mean, really, you know, the only reason that you'd have code that looks exactly like I do is if you're trying to, like, trick someone, you know, and making your code hard to read, perhaps. But there definitely is cases where you'll have two object references pointing to the same object. And why is it important to know that? It's important to know that because if you go and make a change here somehow, you're affecting that object in that list. Okay, so you're, you're affecting it. All right, because again, it's, it's a reference. It's pointing to it. So it's pointing to the same memory location. All right, so therefore if you change one, that effect takes place uh, a lot of places. So um, again, the exact sort of thing that I'm doing, you might not necessarily um, have exactly code like that, but you could very well have similar code and definitely like between two different classes you could have that. All right. Plus, as you said, it's a good way to learn it. It's a good way to learn what's really going on by, by taking these sort of extreme uh, code that is uh, maybe a little bit obscure to make you really understand what's going on and be able to put yourself in the mindset of what the Java runtime engine is doing. All right, other questions? Yes? I have a question about arrays. Yes. And when you pass an array to a function, uh -huh. what are you actually passing? Well, what is an array? Is an array a primitive or is an array an object reference? Okay, yes. An, A's, an array is an object reference. So when you pass an array, you are passing an object reference to it. Okay, so if you pass it to a method, it's not going If you pass it to a method and the method were to change it, it's changing the same objects in there. And we could write a little test code if you want, um, you know, um, I, I, I don't know, uh, you know, I, I could do it upstairs. If you're going to lab, I could, I could write a little test code upstairs to show you uh, the details of that. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's an object. You're passing, an, because an array is an object, you're passing an object reference. Therefore, you're passing a pointer to it. And that lives somewhere on the heap, and it's organized some way internal to Java. But again, the thing to keep in mind is you're passing the pointer. Other questions? All right, we'll see you up in lab then.